Uh, Aloha, and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and uh, welcome you to our program today, uh, wherever you are in our nation. You do know one thing, and that is that the seat of power in the United States and perhaps the world today is in Washington, D.C. Uh, that would actually surprise our founding fathers who really wanted the seat of power to be in the states themselves and that Washington DC or the federal government would really be more like a service bureau supporting the freedoms and liberties and the economies of the states. But a lot has changed and nowhere are the states more impacted than in the state of Hawaii, impacted by the federal government. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and ask this question. What's the prospect for a conservative voice representing Hawaii in Washington, D.C.? Now, uh, when I use that word conservative, let me say something. I, I'm not talking about a political label here, but really a set of values that are believed by Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, across the board, many in every party believe these values. They have to do with protecting individual liberties, our constitutional rights under the Bill of Laws, civil rights. They happen to do with having a robust economy in which small businesses can thrive. And they also happen to do with having government at an appropriate size, not too big, not run away, not spending more th than it should be spending, and not impinging upon the rights and liberties of individuals. Now, these values and these ideas that we stand for at the Grassroot Institute are held by people regardless of party. Uh, today, I'd like to talk with someone uh, or introduce to you someone as my guest, who is an expert in understanding policy as it works in Washington, D.C. and in Hawaii. In fact, in Washington, D.C., he's known as the guy from Hawaii. In uh, Hawaii, he's known as the guy from Washington, D.C., and uh, maybe he'll find a home in Missouri. We'll, we'll, we'll see <laughs> somewhere in between there. But uh, he's a policy activist, which means that he understands the different policies that impact Hawaii and tries to bring about positive change in the Washington arena. Please welcome to my program today, Andy Blom. Andy, so glad you're here. Kili, it's wonderful to be here. It's an honor to be with you, and it's so great well, to be back uh, home. You know, it's delightful to be with you here today, and, and you've been working very hard uh, to see that values that really represent the, the things that Hawaii people need and want for a better economy and for our own freedoms are advanced in Washington, D.C. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I was not originally from Hawaii, but I had the great good sense to marry a girl from Kauai. Good for you. Yeah, it was the only smart thing I did, and I've spent a good deal of time out here. I've been involved in policy and political organizations and campaigns out here, and have also been very extensively active in Washington. I ran for four years, I ran the American Principles Project that was one of the you know, is a one of the most significant of the nonprofit policy. I, I like to call it an action tank. It, That's right. We we do think, but we got intro legislation introduced at the national level and in seven different states on a on a variety of both social and economic issues. And when so, you started, and you're being a little bit modest, when you started with the American Principles Project, it, it was a small organization with a whole of two employees, a few hundred thousand dollars, and, and when you left, it had grown to... 27 employees, actually, and plus some part-time people, and... and multi-million dollar multi budget. Multi-million dollar budgets. The growth was very dynamic. We started out in a small office, and People were afraid to go to lunch because they'd lose their desk because there were people sitting around waiting to find sure. a place to work. But we we actually organized and sponsored and structured the first presidential debate in the last um, in the last presidential cycle, for instance. Well, that's and, something. Now, you've been trying to use your influence and connections in Washington D.C. to advance individual liberty in Hawaii, freer markets, limited accountable governments. But let me ask you this question. Because it may not be apparent to everybody. Why do we have to go to Washington, D.C.? I mean, here our prices are high, uh, except, for an occasion, except for the recent uh, downturn in gas prices. In general, uh, we have some of the highest cost of housing. Uh, we are one of the worst business climates in which to try to start a small business. Yeah. What does going to Washington, D.C. have to do with that? Well, unfortunately... A great many of the things that cause what you just talked about are 
can only happen and only be fixed in Washington, D.C. We're all thrilled about our gas prices. I just filled my car up at Costco uh -huh. because it was only $2.55 right. at Costco. Yeah. It was $1.98 when I left Virginia last week. Okay, so Costco, here, and it was $3.29. We, we're and very familiar with it creeping up to beyond $4 here. Yeah. So, the, But these no, are things that can't be fixed here. Okay, they can't be fixed here. Why is it that they can't be fixed here? Well, a good part of our costs are here, and, and you always don't want to throw the baby out with uh -huh. the bath where there's a lot of different things going on. good part of our problems are the 100-year-old shipping restrictions of the Jones Act. Okay, then let's uh, let our viewers, although we've talked about a lot about that on this program, let's remind our viewers what that is, that that's a federal law that governs carrying of cargo by ships between American ports, and, and there's certain features to that. Well, any cargo between two American ports has to have an American-built, right. American-owned, American-flagged, and American-crewed ship. Okay, so th there were ostensibly reasons of national defense back in the well, last century. It was to protect century. the merchant marines so that in, right. the, in case of war, mm -hmm. that we had a ship shipbuilding industry. We had a maritime industry, not just shipbuilding, but crews, right. and so that we could move goods and move people in case of conflict. The world's changed That's a right. lot. The way we do warfare has changed, yeah. absolutely. And we no longer segregate ourselves uh, from our allies and even our enemies. China was a, uh, is not an enemy, but China was intimately involved in our RIMPAC games in which we shared, right. shi shared ships, intelligence, personnel, all and in the same ga th th games. Exactly. And we, we, sh we work in a global economy now. And there, is re there are reasons that we want to have a shipbuilding industry, but of the six shipbuilders who build military ships in the United mm -hmm. States, only two of them build merchant ships. Okay. So we are not in any way impacting our defense capability when, if we, for instance, simply changed the part of the Jones Act that said, let's allow American companies to buy, let's allow them to ship between two ports on foreign built ships. Now, presumably we'd want to do that because that would help us economically. R right now, because of the shortage of ships. It would mean about $3,000 in the pocket of every family All in right. life. Now, Just that. If we had that kind of boom, simply because we were able to buy our ships from our allies, uh, that would be something that would help our economy. It wouldn't hurt our, our national defense. It wouldn't hurt jobs whatsoever. No. And so, but it doesn't take place from Hawaii. Here, we, here we're trying to, to go to our state legislature, go to our governor. Uh, and, but the state legislature can't do anything about that's this. That's right. And this because this is a federal law about 100 years old. Well, uh, how, how uh, eager are, is our congressional delegation to make a difference in terms of modifying or updating this federal they law? They all support the Jones Act. Jones Act as it has been. As it has been. But th Without this modification. This is the problem, or a significant part of the problem, and that is that we have a federal delegation in the Senate and in the House who will not engage this issue on behalf of the people of Hawaii. Now, we're not the only state affected, but we are well, probably the most important state affected, and it has such a damaging impact on our economy. So we need to see that other senators and other representatives hear about this. We need to bring together the different states and businesses and the and talk to the representatives of Florida and Texas and North Carolina and New York and California who are impacted by this as well. So if there's going to be some change that benefits Hawaii, such as an exemption for Hawaii to the, from the Jones Act, or at least part of it where we get our ships, mm -hmm. or if there's going to be any modification, we currently in Hawaii can do nothing about it. Our congressional delegation is not assisting us in that. Our legislature is not. Our governor is not. So right. we would have to get to Washington and mobilize others. Who would have to be mobilized to bring about change in, in this Jones Act? Well, obviously in the fine, you know, 
in the end, we need to have legislators carry the ball for us. But in Congress. In Congress. A, a bill through Congress would be necessary a bill through to make a permanent change, a, yeah. a modification of the Jones Act. That means congressional delegations from the other 49 states. Right. Would and there be support for Jones Act modification from others? There would be, but it's not on their radar. So what we have to do is have a voice in Washington that talks to other organizations, the national equivalents of grassroots, for instance, that builds a coalition that can be strong enough to be heard by other legislators, to work with sure. organizations like grassroots in other states mm -hmm. to have them communicating to their legislators so that we build a build momentum, we build awareness of the issue, we build a coalition of the parties that are influenced, and we start to gain, for lack, you know, it's the Washington word, we gain clout gain to clout. speak to uh, Congress people and senators from other states and have them begin to take some How action. That? So, so not only do we lack clout for reform of the Jones Act and similar issues, what you said before was so profound. We're not, Hawaii is not even on the map of most people in Washington, D.C. Now, now, let's talk about that a little bit. I'm sure they know that Hawaii is a beautiful vacation destination right. with beautiful sky, ocean, sea. Oh, everyone's uh, jealous. It's Particularly right now place. when it's, when it's right. 9 Especially degrees here right at Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right. But, but in terms of doing anything, in terms of national legislation that would affect our economy, that's not on the map at all? No, it's not. It's, we're not on the radar because the people who we've sent to Washington aren't making this an issue. So there is no other voice there saying, wait, Hawaii needs this. Here's the facts. Here's the information. Here's how the people of Hawaii feel. The people we have sent there do not make this part of their agenda. And it's a critical part of the future of Hawaii's economy. It's critical to the average family's agenda. Until people in Washington hear that it's important in Hawaii, they're not going to do anything. Well, I do want to underscore that statement that you made. Andy Blum from Washington, D.C. and Hawaii tells us that when it comes to major economic legislation, things that can help Hawaii's economy, we're really not on the map of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're we're going to come back and talk a little bit about that more and other ways in which that's the case and what we can do about it. I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute. We'll be right back on Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network after this short message. Don't go away. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zili from the Yap Show, every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. You can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, Mike's <laughs> like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Welcome back to A Hanakako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And my hat goes off to Jay Fidel and the entire crew here. What a wonderful job they're doing in putting about 20 to 25 hours of wonderful broadcast content, original content, uh, onto the air every week. And you can see that content at www.thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, I'm very delighted that today we have a policy activist uh, who travels between Washington, D.C. and Hawaii. Uh, with us, uh, somebody who has led organizations, built organizations to advocate for the good of Hawaii's economy and, and society, Andy Blum. And we've been talking about the fact that very often the problems that we face in Hawaii that deal with our economic environment, our business climate, and so forth, have a lid over them and that we can't really solve those problems solely from within because many of them are caused by federal laws and federal actions. Andy, we were talking about the shipping laws of the Jones Act, but are there any other areas in which we try to do good in Hawaii but have a lid over us and, and we really can't accomplish the whole thing oh, here? Oh, absolutely. So, well, you know how much our economy is dependent on federal money, whether it's the defense yes. budget or you know, our military presence. We get a tremendous amount of money we should tip our hat to Santa Inouye, who started 
this cash flow. But, we but it's a two-way street, isn't, isn't it? On one hand, it, it brought in funding to do many significant things in Hawaii, but it also has kind of created a dependency. Yes, So that has. there's almost a knee-jerk reaction. If, if something happens in the economy, how can we get more money from the federal government? And then with it, we get the strings that are attached. And probably uh, something that I lament even more than the, the strings that are attached, the, we, we get a disincentive to actually building our own economy Ourselves. Well, that's very true. And the more, the bigger the government in Washington becomes and the more dependent we become on it, the more we are at risk of not building a strong economy here in our state. And we are, we're the most geographically distinct place in the world. And I've often heard the word isolated used rather than distinct. <laughs> when I don't want Washington around, I like isolated. Yes. <laughs> but it, you know, and we have. But so much of every part of our life is impacted by the federal government, economically, but in so many ways where the government takes actions in Washington without hearing all the voices from Hawaii, hearing only you know, a very narrow agenda-driven federal, federally That's elected right. legislative group. And so, for instance, the whole issue of Hawaiian sovereignty. And th this is something, you know, it has been hassled around with a bunch of bills in Washington. We have people from sure. 50 states <clears throat> determining what we should be doing, but they're not hearing all the voices out here. And we're in danger now of some of executive and regulatory action establishing very, very impactful things on this state. Right. The, you know, re recently th th there have been some polls th th that have indicated that most people in Hawaii, including Hawaiians, are not in favor of our federal government or our state government setting up a sovereign Hawaiian nation on American soil. Uh, we are people who believe in the aloha spirit. Yeah. We're people who believe in the unity of all of us. Uh, certainly, um, I support the right of anyone to advocate for something, uh, and there are many Hawaiians who have a vision of, of some form of continuity of the historic kingdom of Hawaii, but when it comes to having the U.S. federal government or the state of Hawaii as government entities setting up a race-based kingdom, that's something that most people don't want, and yet, Andy, you it, just it's touched upon it. It's actually antithetical. The first Hawaiian Constitution, that's right. Long before the United States ever got its act together, said all men are of one blood. That's right. And so here's the funny thing, as you've pointed out, the federal government is pushing initiatives for this to go forward uh, under right. the executive branch, the President of the United States. So the Supreme Court has already weighed in and told us that. We can't have race-based elections in Rice v. Cayetano. Congress has weighed in by never passing the, the, the bill that would have organized Hawaiians to be an Indian tribe. Right. But now we have the President of the United States and the Department of Interior. Uh, it's almost as if we can't win that battle here in Hawaii alone. No, and the, you can't because they don't know how the people here feel. What they hear are the political positions, again, of the elected, our elected legislators, but our legislators weren't elected on this issue. And this is, you cited the surveys that find out how the people here feel about it. Washington's not hearing that. And the, what Washington is doing will create the kind of racial division that we've never had here that violates the aloha spirit that violates the heritage and the thinking of you know the great leaders That's like right. king kamehameha iii and replace this with the kind of divisiveness that you see in chicago and new york which we don't want or need they ought to leave us alone they won't leave us alone unless they hear from certainly from us from hawaii and get they're get not the hearing that voice. In other they words, don't hear that the voice. fact that the executive branch may be proceeding in a way that ignores the Supreme Court and ignores Congress and ignores the majority of people in Hawaii, nobody in Washington, D.C., according to you, is really standing up there telling congressmen, telling senators uh, and others what's going on. They, they aren't. What they hear is 
you know, well, Senator Schatt saying, yes, we need this. At one time when the Native Hawaiian Reorganization Bill, known as the Akaka Bill, was mm -hmm. on the, the, the map, uh, it at least alerted other uh, states' delegations to fight against it. Right. To say, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, one, one nation in Hawaii, we're going to have people on an equal footing, uh, and so forth. They were even saying that we're going to have the Aloha Spirit in Hawaii. But now that Senator Noye has passed away, the uh, Senator Akaka uh, has re resigned, resigned. Uh, or retired, the, there's nothing to rally against. So how does that affect the visibility of Hawaii? Well, again, we're not on the map. We're not on their mm. radar because the only thing they hear are the voices of the elected officials. Mm. And the elected officials will not stand f with the people of Hawaii on this. They have their own agenda. So no one in Washington is hearing what is a daily conversation out here. Well, you know, I want to tell our, our viewers this, that uh, after we do take a short break in a moment, we're going to come back and talk about what can be done. And the reason I say that now is because it's sounding pretty gloomy to talk about what's going on. There's another area, uh, and the entire nation knows this, but Hawaii knows this acutely. And that is two and a half years ago, we had a functioning health care insurance delivery system in our state in which 93% of all in people the were covered. And while it was a partnership between government and uh, private sector and everybody may not be pleased with the balance there, nonetheless the coverage was tremendous. Other states were looking at us saying how can we model our health insurance program after Hawaii and then all of a sudden with the Affordable Care Act we've done significant damage to our system and are holding a bill for a system that's not working. Uh, that was something that we could do nothing about, can do nothing about, could do nothing about. Uh, and again, it has to do with not, he not having a voice in Washington other than a, uh, look, I, I am not opposed to, uh, to electing Democrats. I don't mean this. But we have four people in Washington who are very agenda-driven, and their agenda is not always in the best interest of Hawaii. And the people in Washington don't hear anything else. And the Affordable Care Act, I went to see my eye doctor over here on uh, Kapahulu, and he said, you know, for what it costs for the people we funded under the Hawaii Health Connector, we could have bought every single one of them the Cadillac plan, the absolute best plan, and a new Honda Accord every year. <laughs> That's the Unaffordable Care Act that's tearing apart Hawaii's best health care system in the nation. Well, this is the opposite of what James Madison and others of our early founders envisioned, which we call federalism. And, yes. And that is that power remains in the states, and the federal government does just what is needed that the states can't do. But it seems that increasingly we're moving against this kind of federalism, and instead we're moving to a federal governmentism, so, so to that, speak. That, that is a very effective phrase. That is what is going on. But until the voices are heard, it will keep going in that direction, and our voice is not there in Washington. The voice for the people of Hawaii who are every day struggling, who are working, you know, that family that's working 3.2 jobs and is struggling and is fighting these high prices and all everything that is affecting our economy and affecting our, you know, our daily lives here, like the, you know, like the nation within a nation, which is going to have a dramatic daily effect on Hawaii. We're not part of the conversation. Mm. And when we're not part of the conversation, the federal government never does anything that makes it more efficient, smaller, more useful to the average person. The best health care system in the country was replaced by a document so huge, nobody's read it, nobody knows what it's doing. But now we're going to start seeing the the actual effect of this. We're going to see pe small businesses laying off people because they can't afford to pay them health care as they're required to. Mm. We've also seen the federal government involved in lobbying here in Hawaii. Uh, recently, Hawaii uh, passed a minimum wage law in the last 
uh, mm -hmm. legislative session that mirrors the federal minimum wage law, despite the fact that both conservative and non-conservative business groups ranging from Smart Business Hawaii to the Chamber of Commerce went to the legislature and said, no, this is going to damage business. Uh, and then on the day that it was passed, the next day it was held up as a model by the President of the United States in, in his uh, advocacy to get this law passed in all the states. And so here we are, little Hawaii, the recipient of that kind of power, but really unable to, to change that. Uh, it's very hard for a small number of people in what's admittedly a very small state with a small population to fight that kind of power. But when they come in and bigfoot Hawaii like that, we all pay in the end. And that's, people lose their jobs in the end because of this activity. Business is closed because of this activity. A lot of people don't realize, you know, they tend to view business as the enemy. Business takes their money. And they don't realize how important enabling business to scrape by on the relatively small profit margins business does, how much it affects their neighbor and their wife and their child and their opportunity to get a job. Sure. And this is, you know, and when the federal government comes in and does that and hurts Hawaii business, we all in our homes pay in the long run. Well, when we come back from a break, which we're about to take in a moment, Andy, I'm going to ask you oh, something briefly about the recent elections here, which ensured that our congressional de delegation would be all Democrat in a predominantly Republican Washington, D.C. And I wonder whether that bids well for how effective they'll be as a, as a voice for Hawaii. <laughs> we'll come right back after this. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. My guest is Andy Blom, a policy activist traveling between Hawaii and Washington, D.C., trying to do his very best to do good for Hawaii's economy and better government here in our state. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this short message. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel, that's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world, and there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around, be energized, right here on Think Tech. Aloha. Oh, okay, Aloha, and welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Uh, Ehana Kako, that may sound familiar to people in Hawaii. It sounds like a pule kako, which means let's pray together. Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we say Ehana Kako, which is let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, not working together. But we invite everyone to work together to build a better economy, government, and society for the state of Hawaii. And that's exactly what Andy Blom has committed himself to do as an advocate for Hawaii in Washington, D.C. Andy, uh, with the recent political uh, elections, we saw a Republican sweep across the country. We saw Hawaii send a completely Democrat d delegation. Does that weaken the voice of the Hawaii delegation? Oh, absolutely. There's been intense partisanship in Washington for some time. And the new, very, you know, very aggressively elected Republican legislature is going to be taking a very serious conservative approach. And they're determined to be very active. But our voice just got softer by a significant margin. So, and that's kind of like a, a, a double hit for us. On yeah. one hand, the voice of our congressional delegation is smaller, less influence, less power. And secondly, whatever values such as the ones we've talked about today, um, uh, reforming the Jones Act and so forth, that might come through them will even have less voice alt altogether and probably less inclination on their part to stand up for people of Hawaii. But, but I think you see I think it's there's slightly... an opportunity yes. here. Yeah, tell me that opportunity. I think there's a really important opportunity because whether they're comfortable with it or not, our legislators are going to have to work 
with this Republican Congress. And we have a responsibility, the Grassroots Institute has a responsibility to help give them the information, the opportunities, the education to build bridges to that Congress. I love that. In fact, by building bridges on issues as opposed to on politics or on party label, our own congressional delegation in Washington, D.C. can become stronger in their voice Absolutely. and representation of Hawaii. Absolutely. They could, we can help empower them in that Congress because we can help build the connections, first of all, well, and the bridges so that they can do, do good for Hawaii. Well, that's good news to hear because there are Democrats here in Hawaii who have actually come on board over the last couple of years on a platform of Jones Act reform, and we're going to see more of them. Uh, that I'm talking at the state legislative mm -hmm. level. We have several Democrats who are extremely cautious and have spoken against the advancement of a, a government-sponsored race-based nation as well. And so maybe working with them? Yes. Uh, uh, the congressional delegation in Washington, D.C. can reach out to Republicans on issues where Republicans stand strong, uh, such as Jones Act reform. I think that the opportunity here is in both building that momentum and those coalitions here to help persuade our congressional delegation and giving them the information that I really believe they have not looked into or they wouldn't be standing where they do. These issues, whether it's the nation within a nation, whether it's the Affordable Care Act, whether it's the Jones Act, there are bridges that can be built and if they will b start to build those bridges, they will find a very receptive Republican majority. Yes. You know, during the last uh, year and a half, there have been a handful of U.S. congressmen who've come to Hawaii uh, from out of state, uh, and uh, we've had the opportunity at Grassroots to give briefings. And what I find uniformly, whether I meet congressional members in Hawaii or when I'm traveling or at conferences, our, our message resonates with them the moment we explain it. Exactly. And, and, and they have offered to be of assistance in advancing legislation, but we've not had our delegation from Hawaii putting forth that, that legislation. Let me ask you a question. What kind of influence, from your experience, exists in Washington, D.C. that might be harnessed for advocacy for Hawaii's real needs? Well, that's a very good question because with a minority legislative delegation and where in many cases we're speaking in ways that they have not, we need to build strength behind us. And there are, the, the way you build this momentum in Washington is in working with other groups, first of all, and with influencers, with individuals, you get issues into the media, you, yeah. um, we could present a coalition letter asking for a reform of the Jones Act and have 50 significant organizations sign that in support of us. Those organizations are active in all the states. They're going to make the legislators across the board begin to pay attention. And so it's building these coalitions and building, getting the issue through them and through working with national media, getting the these issues on the radar, letting people know how it affects Hawaii and the rest of the country, and gaining support of other influential organizations and people that begin to move Congress. You know, I know you agree with me that the best use of the term conservative is to be issue focused rather than political party focused or brand focused and so forth. And uh, those issues, as we've talked about it, are a more limited, accountable government individual liberties, and freer market. You're active, however, with a very gro influential sector in Washington, D.C. and nationwide. Uh, you're, you're in the inner circle in many ways of what we call the conservative movement. You, you weekly sit in a meeting with Grover Norquist uh, of the right. American Tax... Uh, right. The, the Grover's Wednesday meeting has 
between 150 and 200 conservative leaders. Sure. Every significant group is represented. You are named one of the 100 most influential conservatives in the country and so forth. I think I'm 99, there, but yes. <laughs> are, and you're, you, you move in the circles of a growing power base. Yeah. How effectively can that be harnessed for the benefit of Hawaii? Oh, and let me first ask you, why does that group have to be tapped into for the benefit of Hawaii? Well, that group has to be tapped into because after this most recent election, they are the people that the new conservative Congress looks to for ideas, to determine what's important, to see that those are the groups and organizations that built the support that elected these people. So they have tremendous influence in this Congress and the directions they take, the places where they put emphasis, are where the new legislation, legislatures are going to go. Are influencers in this orbit open to working in a bipartisan fashion? Yes, this is, these organizations and people, we're, we're labeling them conservative. They are issue driven, not party driven. They have as many problems or issues with the Republican Party as they do with the Democrat Party. What they care about are, well, issues you've been saying here, you know, lower taxes, less government, fewer government restrictions, um, but they want to see more individual freedom. They work with any legislator who is going to support the issues they care most about and they're going to provide information, support, and frankly, wait to people who are interested and work on their issues. So there's a need, as we spoke earlier, of harnessing the influence of elected lawmakers in Washington, D.C., but also, as you point out now, a, a large group of influential people who line up on these conservative issues, who who are nonpartisan, or, or, or well, they, they're at least bipartisan. Oh, they, almost every one of them is officially nonpartisan. Right. And, and yet, neither of these groups, our elected officials, nor these influential conservatives, are going to be harnessed to help Hawaii through our current congressional delegation unless we do something. Unless for we do something, unless we do two things. One is we need to be attempting to educate our congressional delegation on these issues, giving them the, the information that Grassroot, for instance, has produced extensively on the Jones Act, seeing that they take a serious look at this, and bringing this information to the table of these influential people, these influential groups, making it part of the discussion in Washington. Our job has to be, because our congressional delegation doesn't, our job has to be seeing that oh, these people hear Hawaii's voice and they help us carry it through the legislature. Mm. A voice from Hawaii is so absolutely essential. Uh, it, it has struck me recently uh, how little we can change Hawaii from within unless we also have change from outside of Hawaii. And this affects everything from our international positioning to uh, our own economy. And, and it all almost, it, it makes it look very futile to be fighting without actually having a voice oh, of power is. in Washington, D.C. And very frustrating. You, we keep talking about the Jones Act, but Grassroot Institute, and you personally have had uh, significant dialogue conversations around the Pacific Rim. One of the visions for Hawaii's future economy is as the center point for Pacific Rim commerce. Right. But if you want to start going around the Pacific Rim and asking the key nations there, they all hate the Jones Act and find it very limiting. And it's a limit to what Hawaii can do in the future as that focal point of the Pacific Rim. We can't do anything about that. Only Washington can. And if our legislators won't do anything about that, we have to take the other routes. We have to involve the organizations and the media that can be heard in this new Congress and bring these issues up. We need to put Hawaii and these issues on the map in Washington. Well, what you're really talking about is an avenue of generating influence that doesn't depend upon our elected office holders. 
one that calls upon the people of Hawaii to rally together and, and to actually go out there and get that influence or harness that influence. Yes. This is a, this is a different vision, I think, than, than we've had in the past. We've relied almost exclusively on the governmental structure, on our elected officials. Well, we had an extraordinary senator we've, for a long time and brought so much to Hawaii that in some ways we got lazy. But with this new Republican majority, and it's a Republican majority that's angry at not having been able to do anything because, frankly, under Harry Reid's leadership, the Senate would not act on anything. So even when bills were passed, they were stonewalled. They want to take action. They want to do things. They need to hear from Hawaii because what they're going to hear from our delegation isn't going to be heard. But that doesn't mean they're not open to it. If they hear from Hawaii, if they hear about the important things from Hawaii, by the people with influence on them, the people who've helped get them elected, the groups that have supported them and brought them forward, we have, oddly enough, because of the change in Congress, we have a chance to be heard more clearly than we've had in a long time. Mm. Well, that's it hopeful, especially hearing after all of these years in which we've really been under the umbrella of federal intervention and need to do something about getting outside of that. Andy, you love Hawaii. Oh, it's home. It's, it's home to you. Your heart is here, although I think you make your home somewhere outside of D.C. right now. I'm, I live here. I live there. I still in California time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that right now there are things that can be done for Hawaii in D.C., and I'm trying to identify and work on the opportunity. Great. I well, don't want to treat this like I've been exiled or sentenced. <laughs> well, it's a good note to end on, Andy. You certainly are doing a good job, and I hope you'll keep it up going to Washington, D.C. on behalf of Hawaii and bringing home influence that can be used in order to build a better economy, government, and society. I've been with Andy Blum. This is Kaylee Aquino with the Grassroot Institute. We'll be back next week on a Hanakako on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. And see you then. Aloha. <laughs>